Good morning, everyone. It's Gateway Open Office Hours, episode 61. I'm your host, Carter Laren. Uh, Ed McMahon is out this week. See what I did, Michael? He's out. Uh, he's, ben is dead to me. Um, as always, you can catch us on Facebook every Friday around 10 o'clock. And uh, catch us on YouTube and, what, podcasts, whatever else. I don't know. I don't think we have any news this week. We do have with us... Uh, a guy I've known, friend, a guy I've known for, uh, I don't know, at least a few years back when I was stupid enough to be in the music industry. Uh, this guy, though, is successful in the music industry. His name's David Hyman. Uh, you may know him from Grace Note, Mog, Beats Music, and most recently, Chosen slash Blingy. Welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Carter. I, it's been a while. We keep trying to have lunch, so this was the solution. It's true. It's so, true. Uh, yeah. Are you serving is, here? Do I... Get a lunch? No, or, uh, no, no, no. Okay. This, uh, you get coffee. All right. That's uh, that's lunch. That's what Peanuts, we call lunch. <laughs> almonds. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we're a little bit more like Southwest Airlines. Uh, okay, honey, so it's, honey, it's, it's, honey nuts. <laughs> yeah, we'll make Great. bad jokes and give you some nuts. That's okay. The, that's right. what you get. Sure. So, um, yeah. So thanks for coming. I uh, appreciate it. You're not a cannabis founder, but we don't no. always talk about cannabis. So we can talk okay. about cannabis. You can talk about cannabis if you'd like to. Uh, but first, I want to talk about kind of your background and history because uh, I think I mentioned off air you're one of the you're one of the people that I I re admired who could navigate the music industry in, in a way that I certainly couldn't when I tried to. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know I think I know you started in online advertising, but the first kind of music thing that, to my knowledge, was was uh, Grace Note. Is that right? No. Oh, okay. So no, it happened. Correct me. <clears throat> yeah, years before Grace Note. Okay. So, 1995, um, along with a guy named Michael Goldberg, we started the first music website. Really? Yeah. What was it called? It was called Addicted to Noise. Oh. So Addicted to Noise launched mid to end of 1994. Okay. This is after I left Hotwired. Yep. Hotwired was the first ad-supported website in the world. It was created by Wired Magazine. Right. My early claim to fame there I think I sold the second ad on the internet. That's what I read on Wikipedia. Oh, yeah, well, you. then it's true. So it must be my, true. My yeah. boss sold the first one. <laughs> okay. um, and there's a guy I just got reconnected with, Jonathan Nelson from Organic, who invented the ad banner along with my boss. And I was in the room when, when they did it. It was kind of wild. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So when to start a So you ruined the internet, though, is the summary of that. I don't think the internet would exist. That's true. If there was an advertising. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a, a sad but true point. Yes, yes, very you know, fair. Or um, it would be the dark net or something. I don't know. It, what would, it would be. be. It would be much worse. Yeah. All right. So, so that, so, but then you did uh, Addicted to Noise. So, Addicted to Noise was kind of like the pitchfork of the 90s. It was okay. an editorially driven music destination. We merged with a site in New York called SonicNet. Oh, yeah. It grew to be the largest music site on the web, and we sold it to MTV in 1999. Oh, so that's how you ended up at MTV. Yes. I knew you were bought, at MTV, but Sonic I wasn't Net. sure how that happened. That's right. Okay. So at MTV, I ran marketing for SonicNet, MTV.com, VH1, and Nickelodeon. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense Short to me Short-lived. Short-lived. Yeah. And so after that was Grace Note. That's correct. Okay. Tell us a little bit about Grace. Does, does everyone know what Grace Note is? I feel like everyone should, but maybe they don't. Most people I'm older, don't maybe because don't it's plumbing. It's plumbing it's like the that every, everyone has used, and they don't really realize that they use it. Fair. Yeah. Is it still being used? Oh yeah. Oh, see, oh, yeah, I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. I remember I mean, it from CC or from CD days. Yeah, CDDB. Yeah, CC, C, C, yeah, CDDB. CD database. That's correct. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. So, you know, Grace Note was the magic <clears throat> that made everybody able to rip CDs and put music on their iPods. Right. Without Grace Note iPods would have never existed. Right. Because when you put the CD in iTunes to rip it, the fact that you didn't have to type in the names of the songs was Grace Note. Yep. We identified the music, pushed the metadata into iTunes or whatever MP3 encoder you were using. Yep. So when the MP3s appeared on your iPod or whatever device you used, you didn't type that stuff in. Right. And the truth is, nobody would have typed that stuff. Right, in. no. Yeah, of course not. <laughs> like it would have been a complete nightmare. Yeah, yeah. The, literally, it wouldn't have worked. Nobody, Abs no, absolutely. No. Yeah. You're listening to CD, track three. Right, oh, okay. right. Oh, yeah. So we enabled that whole market. We were built into every single MP3 encoder in the world. 
Okay. Um, there was also a brief period of time between CD changers and cloud music where you know cars went from CD changers to hard drives in cars. Yep. That was you know, fast. It's funny that to was think not about, long. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Grace Note was, you know, basically made that market and made hundreds of millions of dollars supporting that market because those devices didn't even have keyboards to put in the metadata. Right. Right. Yep. So even if you wanted to, even if you wanted, you to, weren't going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Grace Note ended up doing a lot of other things. You, know, uh, you know, audio signature. Uh, similar to Shazam, where yep. you're doing waveform analysis to identify a song. Grace Note really built a big business around that too. So most people don't know all the ways they touched Grace Note. Okay. If you ever used Apple Genius, where it scanned your hard drive to figure out what was in your collection, that was, that Grace, was Grace Note. Note. Okay. So much of the recommendation engine technology that powers a lot of the cloud-based services um, is Grace Note. Okay. So Apple's radio service was all Grace Note data. They've got all this metadata. They understand the relationships between all the songs using collaborative filtering algorithms. And should probably move to machine learning now, but. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I think that's always like interesting about, and, and I don't think we should get into a technical discussion about it, yeah. but the technology behind being able to identify a waveform quickly and figure out what song, it is actually quite complex. It's mm -hmm. not like a, if you think about it as an engineer, yeah. you yeah. realize very quickly, like this is not an easy problem. <laughs> Um, it's kind of amazing that it's yeah. done so well. You have to have a signature for the whole song. Right. And you never know at what point somebody's going to hit within that song. Right. So the signatures are very big. You have to store all that data in RAM for it to be fast and churn through millions of tracks and yep. all yeah. that good stuff. And Grace Note was eventually sold to Nielsen, right? Is that right? Over time. Over so time. Okay. first Sony bought it. Oh, OK. Uh, Sony bought it for $260 million or something like that. Okay. And then um, they sold it to Tribune Company. Oh, that's right. And Tribune, Tribune Company sold. is kind of in the whole business of TV metadata like um, Gemstar. Yep. So the TV listings that show up on your TV where you pull up those on-screen guides. Right. Tribune was like, is big in that world. Or if you have a TiVo right. and you want to program it, all that data comes from Tribune Company. Yep. Tribune Company, yeah, pushed all of their metadata stuff from TV into this giant holding company that was Grace Note. Went up to like 1,500 employees. Okay. And still is. Okay. Um, and Nielsen just bought it for 450 million or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, not bad. Yeah. Not a bad, not a bad run. Yeah. yeah. But you left Grace Note before, uh, before all of that, I guess. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, you know. You did okay for yourself. I was an owner. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. I left because through that trajectory, I became very passionate about something, a new way to use music identification that no one had really done before. Um, and I was so passionate about it that I had to go leave and just do it full time. Yep. So we're building Grace Note. There's this company in England, not a company, a kid. Okay. <laughs> um, that built something called Audio Scrobbler. Okay. Audio Scrobbler was a way of using music identification for the purposes of social discovery. So okay. he would track, he built a little thing called Scrobbler that sat on your PC that tracked everything that you played in Winamp or whatever media player you used and showed that in a HTML page so that your friends could see what you're listening to in real time. They could see. Huh. Yeah. This guy was ahead of his time. Yeah. 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 So I went. Shit, this is music identification for the purpose of, of, of making friendships through music and social discovery. Right. That's huge. We're, we've been focusing on ripping CDs and right. all these other things, but this is awesome. And like, you know, reached out to him, tried to buy him and pull him into Grace Note. He didn't want to sell to us. He ended up selling to Last FM. Oh, okay. And was a key component to that company's success, which cool. had a very big exit. Yeah. So, so I felt like I could leave Grace Note and build a better version of Audio Scrubber. Okay. Because there were things that he wasn't doing that um, with Grace Note technology, I thought we could do. Could do better. Yeah. Yep. For example, he only showed data in real time about what you were listening to. He didn't show the totality of your collection. 
Oh, okay. So you never scanned your hard drive up front to show your whole collection. I want to, be, to uh, enable people to see inside your iPod through an HTML interface, right. which he couldn't do. So that was the early kind of implementation of Mog. Okay. Yeah. And then Mog, I mean, Mog for a while was, I think, regarded as like the best streaming music service for, yeah. for quite a few years. Yeah. I, right. I would say it still is if it existed. Right. But it, yeah. it's been <laughs> eaten by the gorilla or yeah. whatever the, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so. So Mog, so you, you founded Mog, um, and that grew, as we said, to, you know, I think it was like 10 bucks a month or whatever for mm -hmm. kind of all-you-can-eat music streaming. But it wasn't like Pandora. You didn't have to, like, skip. You could, you know, you didn't have to have a limit to how many songs you could skip or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, it was it, much more Spotify-like in that sense. Exactly. It was, it was equivalent in the kind of licensing structure of Spotify or Apple's yeah. music service, which... Mog ultimately became Apple Music. And I think okay. one of the things, just as a tech guy, that um, tech people don't think about when when you're working in the music industry, but it was something that when I was before the show, like reading up on your Wikipedia to kind of remind myself and learn about stuff that I didn't know, um, I was reminded of like, crap, that's a lot of licensing deals. Like you got, you have to be Mr. Licensing Deal Guy to be able to go talk to all these Absolutely. slow moving, hard to deal with horrible entities around, mm -hmm. <laughs> around the world that own rights to a whole bunch of different crap to Absolutely. get this to work. Yes. Um, and so that's, that's it's yeah. quite a slog. Yeah, I was actually just telling this story to someone yesterday. There were, there were moments where you know, we were launching our mobile streaming service. We launched desktop first and it took us a while to get the mobile app out. Um, the labels had separate licenses for that. Don't ask me why, but it was, it was a separate thing. You, you can do desktop, but you can't do mobile because yeah. that's different. So right. you got to come back and get your mobile license. <laughs> so, so they were just dragging their feet. We were set to go live at South by Southwest. We had partnerships in place. We did the first uh, in-car implementation with BMW Mini where you'd have streaming service built into the car. We had all this PR set up around our launch date that was planned months in advance. And I still didn't have a license to go live the night before. Jesus. Because one of the labels is just slow. So it I wasn't that they didn't them. want to do it. They were just slow, basically, or? They're slow. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a very different industry. They are selling stuff to you. But unlike most companies that have like sales guys that go out and try to pitch and win business, they expect you to come to them, even though they're the ones selling something. <laughs> yeah, that's right? an interesting it's point. Like, yeah. Come kiss the ring, baby. Right, yeah. Um, and you get on your <laughs> knees and kiss the ring, and maybe we'll sell you so stuff and take your money. We're not sure. Right. So, Gee, I wonder how they're doing as an industry now. Yeah, well, I always said <laughs> if I worked there, I would completely turn it around and have real salespeople using salesforce.com and pipelines right. and sales goals and go out okay. yeah. and meet the customer instead of making them come to you. Yeah. But anyway, that's not the way it worked. And um, it was 11 o'clock at night, the night before I was going live and I didn't have one of the biggest labels on board. And I had to say, I'm going live tomorrow with your stuff, even though I don't have a license. And if you need to come and sue me, then that's just the way it's gonna have to play out. What'd they say? And then we got the deal done. Nice, all yeah. right, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, so go. sometimes you have to take it to the <laughs> mat, you know? Yeah, that's pretty crazy. So yeah. Mog then was purchased by Beats Music, <clears throat> which you right. ran for a while. Yep. Um, and then I don't know if you want to talk about there's a little bit of a kerfuffle on the exit. Yeah, uh, yeah. But um, um, obviously I'm, everyone knows it was eventually uh, purchased uh, by Apple. Right. I'm not allowed to talk about certain parts of that transaction. That's fine. But you, yeah. I am allowed to say what's on Wikipedia, which is... Sure. Which is uh, you ran Beats Music for a while, yeah. um, and then I think left in in a way where it was clear that they wanted some equity because they knew there was an acquisition coming up, and wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to pay uh, the CEO? Um, kind of. I cannot. I know you can't comment. Or it's okay. You don't, just, any of these things. Just blink once. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so great. So then, after all of this, um, you know you you decided to start Chosen. Mm -hmm. um, want to talk about Chosen a little bit. So these are all, we're all talking about things that were, I think by anyone's metric, pretty successful entrepreneur background here. You've got, you know, you've got Grease Note, you've got Mog, you ran Beats Music. I mean, 
it's a pretty successful career. Thank if anyone you. can continue your, the success, it would be you. Why, well, thank you. Um, and I, when I saw Chosen, I was like, oh, this is just going to be another like oh. home run for David. Good for him, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and you got Ellen DeGeneres involved. Yep. Tell us a little bit about what Chosen uh, is slash was sure. and what the thought process was there. So while I was building Mog, you know, I recognized and sympathized with myself for being in a business that had very low margins. Yep. So everyone knows with your Pandora or iTunes or Netflix, this relationship between the distributor and the content owner is, is a very um, you know, symbiotic relationship. They both need each other. Um, both sides complain about how much they're getting out of the equation. Um, but as a streaming service provider, you're, you're working off of um, you know, 15, 20% margins. Right. You know, 70% of the, of, of the money is going to the labels and the publishers. So right. when, when kind of the game mechanics of, of Zynga and Farmville came out, which we all probably remember, yeah. right? I thought to myself, someone needs to figure out how to gamify music. Because if you could monetize music through game currency, that could be a way to fix this conundrum around hmm. how to build a business around music. Yep. So I was always fantasizing about the thought of a, the gamification of music. For a while, I had a, a, a name in my head, but I didn't have a product. It's called Playlist Pinball. Okay. <laughs> right? Sounds kind of like cool. Right? Taking yeah. music and taking a game and figuring out something that could be tied to virtual goods and, and, and you know, currency. Yep. So um, after leaving Mog, I um, went to a conference. Maybe you've heard of Summit, those yeah, yeah. guys in Eden, Utah. Yeah. And I'm, I think uh, I've been to Summit, I think, before. Yeah. But okay. Yeah, 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 okay. So I was hanging out there, and I met a guy from Tel Aviv who said, you must meet this, this founder we are, uh, we are backing. He is a brilliant uh, man in Tel Aviv who is very interested in building something in music around games. I'm like, funny you should say that. I'm actually really interested in that, too. Um, and I met the guy, and we kind of loved each other and decided to start this company. Okay. Um, the concept was um, kind of a take on traditional performance competition um, experiences. American Idol kind American of thing. American Idol, yep. The Voice, um, that's incredibly popular throughout the world. Every country has its own version of that. Yep. And we all love watching performance competition. So our take was, could we do something where we turn the spectators, the collective audience, like the 99% of us who are part of this experience, can we become a part of the game? Yep. Where we're actually competing with each other to prove our expertise at spotting and judging talent. Okay. Right. So could we gamify this whole performance competition space where it's not just the performers competing, but the audience. We all want to be Simon becomes, Cowell or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so we spent a really long time trying to figure out those game mechanics of how to make that work. And you did, kind we, of. We did, but we never really cracked the code that got us the retention metrics that you need to have to have a like high-performant, uh, big revenue-generating game like a farm bill. Right. Um, it's really an art form, um, and most games don't get those metrics. And I don't know how detailed we want to get into that. Well, look, I mean, even even companies like King, who have a, a big hit, yeah, they can't often repeat it. It's, it's you know similar right. to music. You get one hit wonders yeah. all the time. That's right. Right, and That's so right. that does speak to the. It's kind of an art, and it's yeah. not just a repeatable process that you you know yeah. rinse and repeat. And I felt well, I still feel like someone should and could crack that code. Yeah, because. I still believe in it. It's just something that requires a lot of time, and uh, we were running out of that. Yeah. So we had gotten out. We weren't getting those metrics. But what we did see, we saw that the performers who were coming into our app to create the content, their retention metrics, you know, their desire to come back day after day into the app was way higher than the spectators. Right. And that really speaks to the mobile app space in general. Um, you know, apps like Snapchat and Musical.ly 
are all about self-expression. Yep. Right. And so when you know, you're combining kind of a younger demographic of people mostly under the age of 15 who are highly motivated to share themselves right. um, in innumer innumerable ways. W what we're now actually learning is that once you hit 13, some of that drops off. So the, oh, really? the Musical.ly crowd, who are, I don't know how many people are familiar with this app Musical.ly, but it's, sure. it's gotten massive in America. It started in, in, in China. It's a Chinese company. But it's mostly very young adults between the ages of 9 and 13 lip syncing to songs okay. and pushing it out there to share with their friends. It's, it's huge. Um, but once kids hit about 13 and start going through puberty, they become more self-conscious about putting themselves out there that way. Right. And musically seeing a drop off at, at 13 years old of that app. Anyway. Interesting. Yeah. I guess that makes sense just, you know, based on a, probably everyone's own personal experience of kind of growing up in junior high school, high school, you can, you've got that yeah. kind of early on, yeah. you're, you're out That's there better. and then, then yeah. suddenly like, hey, right. like what if right. someone doesn't like my jeans? That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> So we kind of doubled down on trying to build better tools for the performers in our app. Okay. We had launched with some simple uh, karaoke lip sync style tools to let performers create content. And we felt like our path to success would be better if we tried to make better tools for performers than tried to crack the code on gamifying the spectator experience. Right. So it was kind of... You made a choice. Let's, let's go yeah. this way or that way. Um, and so we went down that path and, um, what we tried to do was build something that had never been done before. Um, we all know Snapchat or most of us know Snapchat that, um, has kind of really popularized this, this technology of turning us into puppy dogs and cats, <laughs> sure. um, doing facial recognition. Yep. Uh, to identify where your face is. They actually mostly approximate the placement of your eyes, nose, and mouth. They don't actually know exactly the totality of, of the perfection of your face. Right. But if it's a couple of cat ears, it doesn't it matter. It doesn't matter, much, right? Yeah. And you know, we have some flexibility on our foreheads right. of where those <laughs> things get placed. So I had a very brilliant team of programmers. Um, we wanted to kind of push the envelope in that area and try to do something nobody had ever done before. So whereas Snapchat is really superimposing fantasy onto reality, yep. right? Putting these puppy dog ears on you, you're the reality, mm -hmm. the puppy dog ears are the fantasy. We wanted to superimpose reality on top of fantasy. Okay. Okay. So we wanted we wanted to be able to identify you very clear outline of me. Exact right. outline of you so that we can put you in any environment. Right. Right. Like a virtual green screen without the green screen. So we're standing here now in front of this stuff. But right. with the technology we were or building. Are we? Or are we? <laughs> with the technology we were building, me and you could magically be sitting uh, at, a, at a beach right now. Right. Um, right. Without a green screen just using the camera and the mobile phone. Right. That's a pretty ambitious technical yeah. challenge. Yeah, and so yeah. this requires um, knowing the exact edge of your body right. versus a background. Yeah. And so we went down this path of building a machine learning engine, okay. um, which was an amazing experience to, to do this and to learn about how all of this works. But we essentially trained um, an inference engine that sat uh, on the mobile phone and worked with the GPU to do this. Yep. And we got it to work pretty well. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we like this so much that we decided we should just relaunch our app with a new name that completely focused around this technology. Okay. That's um, blingy. Then. So that was blingy. Okay. Right. We were like, Let's strip everything out and just make the focus this and have it be the star of the show. Right. And so that's what we did. Went live, got a few million uh, installs very quickly. Uh, but these days, the venture market is just getting harder and harder. Right. And we still didn't have the metrics 
with this incredible technology um, and an incredible number of installs that you know we brought in for next to nothing right. to make it to that next level. Okay. Um, and I think it speaks a lot to kind of the venture market and where that's at today. Sure. Um, and where the bar is, because the bar is pretty high. I think we could have a kind of separate discussion about how venture capital is basically broken and weird, and there's a lot of, in my opinion, yeah. I, like there's a lot of weird stuff going on in venture capital. Um, but uh, but let's new, not, let's let's postpone that for another yeah. day. Yeah. Let's dig into a little bit. So you want to talk about a couple things because in many ways, some of the things that you did at Chosen uh, are kind of an entrepreneur's dream of like, oh, I got Ellen DeGeneres to, 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 uh, to be a, I don't know if she invested directly or in mm -hmm. exchange for being on the show or whatever, but yeah. you partnered with Ellen DeGeneres. She yeah. talked about you on air. Yeah, like often, um, you know, she, it was the, the app was very integrated into her show for a while. Yeah, yeah. so it's, I, I think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs have this idea that like, well, if I can get the celebrity, right. I win. That's right. Right? That's um, right. Can you talk a little bit about how that wasn't true, why it's not true, yeah. and what you learned there. Yeah. I mean, not to diss that show. No, it's I, not yeah, her. Just I to say, yeah, actually, yeah. I think those people were incredible to work with. Sure. And I was, I'm, a, I'm incredible thank, incredibly thankful for the opportunity to have that. And their belief in me sure. was, was fantastic. Um, um, you know, you, you really need to, to build a better mousetrap that's going to retain users before you bring a big funnel in like that. Yep. Um, and so we hadn't done that, right? <laughs> we, we, our, our original app was not retaining users well enough to take the funnel that she brought in and keep them in our playhouse. Yep. So if you don't build a better mousetrap to do that, then, you know, getting a bunch of people to come into your app and, and not be sustainable isn't really worth it. You know, there was probably a time where app companies just with that partnership and kind of the inflation of near term numbers could make something Go, yep. look successful, but right. wasn't really long term successful. Yep. And um, that, it does enabling them to raise money. There were probably and, yeah, many yeah. companies that had successful exits based on kind of like, you know, businesses that didn't deserve to get those exits. Yes. But, um, you know, I think our strategy when we ha when we got the partnership was, well, we don't want to say no, they said yes, and right. we're not paying them cash, so let's try to build that machine that's going to retain them the best we can in time right. for the launch of this partnership. Right. Right? So, <laughs> you're yeah. like, you, you knew you needed a good mousetrap. It's not like you didn't know you needed it. Right. Um, you just felt you, like you had wanna, to capitalize on this opportunity. You didn't want to lose that opportunity yeah. either. Yeah. So you're kind of going down the path in parallel of working on that partnership and going, we got to kill this. We're going to kill it. You yeah. know. So, and sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. So the, the, I, I want to dig into this a little bit because it, in one, my intuition is that not only could it not be helpful to have the increase in the top of the funnel without the mousetrap, mm -hmm. it could actually be harmful from a metrics perspective because as an outsider looking at the company, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. oh, all these people came in, yeah. but they weren't the right people, so the retention numbers are bad, and you've got high churn, and then I'm like, well, maybe yeah. this isn't actually great. You, now you've yeah. proven that it's not good instead of just not having any information at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, the other thing we saw there was the demographic of her audience was not thirteen-year-old girls. Was not thirteen-year-old girls. Right. <laughs> um, it was definitely much older. Yep. Um, and looking at the totality of her audience across socials and TV, her socials skew much younger. Like thirteen-year-olds oh. are really obsessed with Ellen and watch segments the way. So many of us watch TV sure. today. Like sure. I don't watch SNL anymore. I just wait for the segment to show up in right. my feed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so her um, her her online audience was much younger, but um, they didn't convert nearly as well as the TV audience into the action item of, of installing the app. Right. So we we saw the the vast majority of her audience coming in while that show was on. Okay, yeah. and then. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't the right people. Yeah. Well, a lot of times it was the mom putting their child in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
That's interesting. Yeah. Not yeah. at all what you Sometimes we'd yeah. see like the mom putting their baby in a crib in front of the camera. Really? Perform. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, look at my beautiful child. Um, it's funny. Yeah. And, and not sweet. at all what and you were sweet. thinking. Yeah, sure. Could, yeah. Be, could be actually an app. Yeah. Sort of, right? Like, yeah. just like totally moms, different. Moms, yeah. you know, the moms Brag love about your kid. And they're like, check out my kid. I love my kid. Like, any yeah. mom. No, would look, love Ben's him. in Hawaii this week, and his Instagram is just all about his baby shots. Who's this? My, my co founder. He's oh. like, yeah, his Instagram's all, or his Facebook's uh, all like, yeah. my baby, my baby, yeah. my baby. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, no, there is a market yeah. for that. It's just yeah. not the same yeah. as what you're going after. So, would you have done the same thing in retrospect? Rewind. Yeah. The Ellen Show comes to you. Yeah. We want to do this. Here's the schedule. Would you, what would you do? You know, those things can and do work. And uh, there's countless examples of, you know, TV promoted phenomena that have created products yep. and successful products. Um, you know, you need a you need a little bit of lightning to strike, and you need a really perfect alignment between the brand and the product and, and the moment. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say that those things can't and don't work because I'm sure they do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, what was interesting for us when we launched Blingy uh, is that instead of going to a big celebrity like Ellen DeGeneres, we did the complete opposite. We went to musically celebrities, people young kids who built a, a loyal following on Musical.ly. Yep. These are 13 to 15 year olds who are really good lip syncers, okay. <laughs> right? Who, who are building their own spheres of influence. Yep. And you know, this speaks to kind of how the whole entertainment industry is changing, right? Yeah. From you know, the big celebs on TV versus we're all spheres of influence now. Right. You know, whether you have five followers on Facebook or a million on Instagram, right. we're all spheres of influence along some, you know, gradation, some, some, you know, line between the Ellen and the 13-year-old who has five followers on Musically. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what was interesting to us is that rolling up a few hundred of these smaller influencers on Musically way outperformed for us as far as their conversion into our app. Okay, so the influencer um, marketing worked well there. For us, and it's all about finding the, the, the perfect fit. So, you know, we have this app that, you know, lets kids magically insert themselves in a music video, yeah. right? So it's a virtual green screen. Instead of using Musical.ly where you're lip syncing in your lame bedroom, right. with Blingy, you're lip syncing, but you're in the video with Taylor Swift. Right. Right? And so... There was just a really kind of perfect connection there for us to take these musically influencers, create videos with our app, which were called Blingies, yep. upload them into Musically, which Musically now lets you do is upload any video into their ecosystem because yep. they want to become more of a platform. And when the followers of these influencers see that, they go, "Wow, this is amazing!" That's awesome, right? You know? Yeah. And you don't get a link that brings people back. You just get our watermark embedded in the video. But that watermark alone it's enough with, to drive. with, with a yeah. young audience that will actually take that mental leap was getting us millions of installs at less than 10 cents per install. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. So what went wrong? That seems like a slam dunk. Like you solved it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think we were really close. And, you know, Sometimes you're really close, but you're not 100% there. So we went out to the VC community, and we thought we built this amazing thing. Right. Um, and the response back was, this is a really great tool. How does this become a platform? Okay. Okay. And so I, I just really think it speaks to the VC market uh, in general now is the bar is much higher. Yeah. And and the, what was explained to me is that a venture fund, let's say it's a, they have a five hundred million dollar fund. Right. The way the economics of that work is that they look at each individual investment as having to have an exit of five hundred million dollars. Right. That's singular, and you know you're in this business. Yeah, so no, well, I've used that me. analogy actually before. I, right. Yeah, I learned it from right. Steamboat Ventures actually oh, years ago. Okay. The same, yeah. Every, so, fund, every investment right. has to return the whole fund, potentially, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot. So, so 
it was a stretch for them to think that this cool technology right. could return their whole fund. Um, and I think that was ultimately the issue. And so whereas you do have these success stories where a tool can become a platform, mm -hmm. Musical.ly started as a tool, became a platform. Instagram was a lens filter tool and became a platform. Yep. For everyone that does, there's about 100 that, that don't. Yep. And I don't hear about the 100 that don't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, we'll do what, what Instagram yeah. did. That worked yeah, out. Yeah, long yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, they they felt like there was too much risk that this could become a platform. Yeah. And we didn't have a compelling story enough of how this tool becomes a platform. Yep. So, so what happens now? I mean, so what happens now when is you wind you get, something down, what happens, right? What, so, what happens now is you say, well, there are all these platforms out there that probably need this tool. Right. Like Snapchat hasn't built this yet, and doesn't Facebook someone want and this? Instagram hasn't built this yet. Right. Musically hasn't built this yet. Right. So uh, you know, you then take your tool and you go, would one of these platforms like this tool? Right. Um, and in our instance, it turns out that they didn't, which is still weird to me. But it's weird to me yeah, too. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Fair enough. Hey, you know, sometimes you're ahead of the curve. Yeah. Um, and you can't always al align things. It could be that Snapchat's now moving out of self-expression into, you know, they're focused on localization today. Right. They're, you know, <laughs> they're kind of changing gears. Um, and, you know, there's that also that notion that whenever you have a great idea as a startup, there's five other people doing the same, same thing. thing. Yep. Well, you know, we met one of these big guys that was building the same oh, thing as us, right, right. and it just launched it. So they didn't okay. need our technology. Right. Um, and another guy did want our stuff, you know, one of, one of the big ones. Yeah. And we went down the path with them. They said they were buying us. And in the very last hours um, after they said they were buying us and uh, the whole deal, yeah. um, they just changed their mind. And For we, no apparent reason. We never really knew why. But at that, at that moment in time, um, you know, I had two weeks of cash <laughs> left in the bank. Uh -huh. And... You move on. Man, that's too bad. I mean, of the it's like, oh, the soft landing is almost there. Nah, uh, you yeah. lost an engine. I mean, yeah, the, it's, it's, the truth it's, is, when you go into this space, you have to go in with the knowledge that this is very much the way it could go down. Yeah. And you know, when I started building these things, whenever I start to build one, yep. I always say to myself, the most important thing is, am I entering a space that I'm passionate about and am I gonna learn? Right. Like, do, am I going to get to wake up every day and feel so motivated by what I'm going to learn? Because if it doesn't work, at least I've gotten the knowledge. And I went down with some intellectual exercise and an itch that I needed to scratch to learn something. Right. And I certainly got that. And I love everything that I learned. So in that sense, it was a success. Yeah. I mean, number one, I like, you know, for myself, I pulled myself out of the music ghetto a little bit, Yeah. right? I started building video and I started doing machine learning and all of these other th gamification, yeah. things I knew nothing about um, that I'm now armed with. Yeah, So, which is great. I mean, that's all yeah. AI, I mean, you, yeah, or yeah. machine learning, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think I, the, the passion thing is interesting because I think there's parallels, you know, I mean, I think you may know a little bit of my history. I know we met when I was in the music industry, but I wasn't from the music industry, and I had this idea of like, oh, I love music, and I'm Didn't passionate. Did you come from music. like um, pornography? Cryptogra no, cryptography. Okay, yeah, yeah. You might have you oh, might remember me from some pornography, cryptography, sure. Cryptography, but that's yeah. a different. That was Didn't just I a side see you in project. That video with. Uh... Actually, I am. I I did have a sex toy company, so you're not oh, far off. Right, actually, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, but uh, why can't I think of the guy? Ron Jeremy. Where? Yeah, Ron Jeremy. Ron I'm, Jeremy. I'm just like Ron Jeremy. <laughs> this is <laughs> thanks, David. <All> right. <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, oh sorry. no, no. So I, uh, I thought oh, look, I'm passionate about music. Yeah, I'm gonna go play in the music space. Uh, and what I learned, partly through through seeing people like you in the music industry, mm -hmm. was. I don't love music. I like music. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm not the guy who's gonna lose his shirt to just kind of get up every day and like keep doing because it it's such a, a passion project for me that nothing will stop me. 
I'm the guy who's like, I, I thought this could be successful and it's not right. going very well. It was, it was EDM driven. It was EDM driven. Yeah. It was, yeah. Well, one thing I've learned is that people who like EDM don't really like music. Oh, ouch. <laughs> ouch. Ouch. That's, I, not, that's oh. like, that's like, yeah. see? That's you know. pretty good. Well, you have to look in the camera. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's thanks. That's like, thanks. <laughs> you know. Doesn't count. It's between music and Muzak. Sit somewhere. <laughs> oh, wow. But. You have another singer? <laughs> Jesus. Oh. You're roasting me. I do like other music, but yeah. EDM, I'd like yeah. EDM. I yeah, grew up, I, I grew up coding and like putting yeah. headphones on and listening to like Crystal Method and shit. Yes. And it was like, okay. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah, got yeah, a driving yeah, beat yeah. and I can code. Yeah. And like, I, yeah, you know, I like, yeah. I like EDM. Yeah. Um, Tiesto notwithstanding. So, you know, like there's the, and anyway, I, the, I learned that like that, that you really need that passion, right? And I didn't feel like, oh good, I'm learning stuff that I really want to learn anyway. I was like, oh, this is, you know, I'm starting to dislike music. Um, yeah. In fact, I started to dislike EDM, frankly. I was I'm like, fuck, <laughs> another fucking concert, another festival I gotta go to, right? Yeah, someone wants to stay up till 3 a.m. doing coke off, you know, I was like, I don't, you know, it was yeah. too much yeah. for me. It wasn't yeah. my, yeah. wasn't my persona, it didn't match. Totally. Um, and, uh, but I think cannabis, in in many ways, you know, we invest in in cannabis mostly ancillary tech, but cannabis related stuff. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of cannabis founders, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a a parallel in that. Uh, I think there are definitely people who are just I'm going to go start a grow because I want to make money. Yeah. Um, and those people end up not doing well. It's the guy who's in love with the plant. Right. Who's like he's right. up at 3 a.m. spitzing yeah. stuff and making yeah. sure everything. You there's know. There's really big parallels to the industry you're focused in right now, the cannabis industry, and the one that I had built in music. Because the story I like to tell at Grace Note, I think we licensed our technology to 3,000 media players. We had a non-commercial license. Okay. Because every college kid who was a programmer built an MP3 player, right? <laughs> yes. Every single yeah. one. Yeah. So you had this massive influx of people into a space out of passion which really decreased the odds of success because yeah it was just everybody wanted to do it right. um and you know you talk of gold rushes right you yep. know the, the, you know that's what the, the parallel people use in the cannabis space yeah. look the gold rush did build all of san francisco sure but right? not the from whole, the gold it was from the levi's jeans right and exactly all the infrastructure all the stuff, around right? it yeah. yeah for sure and I'm sure there were a lot of people who built massive fortunes from the gold, but you know, for for the ten that didn't, there were the thousand that Sounds came out here that, that that didn't make it. Yep. Um, they're not on Wikipedia. Yeah, that's right. They're not on Wikipedia. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> right. Right. So, but they had their own stories, and you know, absolutely. things worked out, and something else happened, and God bless them. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. So let's. Um, Let's, uh, you know, we're kind of getting close to the end here. Mm -hmm. um, I want to I wanna just give you an opportunity to maybe talk um, talk to founders directly about some learnings and some kind of generalized advice yeah. you would give yeah. people. There's a lot of especially first-time founders mm -hmm. um, either coming in from outside the cannabis industry yeah. or already in and, and yeah. wanting to solve some problem. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you've got a lot of experience here as yeah. a, a serial entrepreneur. What are some learnings that you would share? So... I think these days, the way the venture community is set up for the most part is that if you do get seed and angel money and you're working towards that A, you better have a very sustainable business with an incredible trajectory and proven track record if you think you're gonna close an A, Yep. right? So. Uh, the bar is just really high. Like, uh, once you take that angel money, you better crack the code quick. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, or get self-sustaining somehow, or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. get self-sustaining and start getting income. Yep. Um, and and have that working in order for you to get to the to the A. It used to be that, you know, the seed was like, okay, you know, let's get started on your hypothesis, and the A could be like. Well, you have some good data points, but you still haven't figured it out. Here's your A, continue down right. that path. It doesn't go that way anymore. No, I feel like the A has almost turned into a growth round. That's what it is, absolutely. Which is like, what happened to early absolutely. stage venture? Absolutely, And you know, it's interesting. I mean, in some ways that's an impressive thing that 
so many companies can get to that point to go into a growth round for the A, that, that the VCs can be that selective. True. Um, and in some ways it's sad also yeah. for a lot of people. Well, because uh, there is a need for capital to figure your shit out. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. Yeah. You need that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's more bootstrapping and getting your ducks in a row before you even get that angel round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and even the definition of A has moved, uh, you know, it used to be, I feel like 15 years ago, yeah. a couple million dollar round would be a series A. Yeah. Now it's like maybe angel or series seed, they say, or whatever, mm -hmm. like series A is you're raising yeah. generally much more money. Yeah. You know, in certain instances, those A's might be different if you're um, an entrepreneur with an incredible track record um, and a brand name that people just bet on. They're not listening to this show, though. You know, so it like, doesn't, like An about. Andy Rubin can do an <laughs> sure. A round. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I had a friend. I had a friend who's a, a successful entrepreneur, and he he mentioned to uh, I think it was actually Greylock. I'll drop the. the mm -hmm. He mentioned to someone at Greylock. Oh, I'm thinking about starting another company. And without saying anything else, they're like, we're in for $2 million. Yeah. I was like, well, this yeah, yeah, yeah. must be nice, yeah. right? Um, that company actually failed. But it didn't matter. Yeah. He had the brand, and it yeah. was like, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, okay. So, the, the be more kind of bootstrap mindset here. Don't expect, don't expect uh, I don't know, Kleiner to come in and, and rescue you or give you some money to yeah. experiment with. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Right. And I think the concept of building something that can get acquired as a tool or a feature by an Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, um, you know, that's becoming harder and harder to do. Yep. You know, you're not building something where the exit is going to get bought. Are um, you even, you're, should you're you be thinking about an exit when you start or should you just be thinking about sustaining business for a long period of time? I, th I think you, need to be thinking about the exit being a, that you're a self-sustaining business that doesn't necessarily need an exit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Depends how you define exit. <laughs> no, right? no, but like right. not an acquisition. It might be like an IPO or a what, like we're going to, we're going to be profitable. Yeah. That needs to be your thought process. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What did we, what should I, what should I have asked you about Chosen and uh, uh, Blingy that I didn't ask that you just don't want to talk about, but, uh, but I'm going to ask you to talk about it. I don't really, I don't really know. Yeah, that's coy yeah. coy of you. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. All right. Well, cool. How can people um, follow you, pay attention to what you're doing next? What's the best way to... You can follow me <laughs> on my Facebook or LinkedIn pages that have URLs that I don't know. Fair. Do you tweet? Do you Snapchat, Instagram? I, I don't know. I'm, I, no I'm not a tweeter. You're not a tweeter. Twitter never worked for me. Yeah. But I'm an avid uh, user of the Facebook. You, you use the Facebook a lot. Very much. If you want to see like baller speakers, just follow you on Facebook and you'll get like the, yeah. here's the, here's the audio yeah. file equipment that's being that's unboxed right. this week in my that's living right. room. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, look, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, wait, should I be asking, is there questions in the audience that I should be asking? Am I totally fucking this up? Here, wait. I was almost ending the show, but let's ask some well, questions. Yeah. If we got You're going to go okay. out there like Phil Donahue and <laughs> did it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you really have an interesting background. And um, something that came up to me is, you know, regardless if you're in the cannabis market or the music industry or the app marketplace, you know, you always have to be on the cutting edge to be a sustainable and successful company. So for you, over the course of the years, um, what's been your sources of inspiration and motivation for you to go from one thing to the next and continue this, you know, stream of success? Yeah. I think it's a combination of things. One is having not a lot of fear. <laughs> you know, you're constantly free falling and you have to have a bit of the mindset of someone who's willing to just wing it and risk it over and over again. So I'm was kind of predisposed for that, I think. Just you seem to not care that you're like, yeah, it failed, but I learned Well, again, I learned know. stuff. <laughs> I learned something. It's like. You know, there's two paths I could take in this world, right? One is I could work at some company and, you know, just work at some big company, which just wouldn't inspire me enough often to want to live that lifestyle. Or I could just risk it over and over again. Yeah. And 
you know, it nets out maybe better when you take those risks. You don't get 100% success, right. but you get enough successes to offset the failures to get you to live your own life by your own terms. Yep. And so that's just the route that I take. Um, I'm not very political. I don't do well in political organizations. I don't do well in bureaucracy. You know, any kind of thing that creates boundaries or inhibitions, I have problems with when they're, I don't have free movement. Yep. Um, that's even when I'm driving in traffic. Like I can't, <laughs> or when somebody's blocking my walkway in, in, in Times Square and I can't just walk yeah. freely, like those things are tough for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that, and, and then you couple it with just having a lot of passion around things. There are things that I just, I'm obsessed with and I'm a very obsessive person and I can become, you know, fall down the rabbit hole of something I'm really into and that can inspire me. So with a lot of reading and self-education, I'm reading 24 hours a day about lots of different topics that inspire me. So. Cool. Yeah. Any, any other questions that we had to hit? Yep. I, I wonder, um, when I'm working with entre entrepreneurs, uh, I find a lot of them don't know when to give up their business idea because they're so passionate about it. Sorry. They love it. And <laughs> I'm wondering if, and I hear that, you know, through your story that you've yeah. been able to, to start yeah. and restart. Um, I wonder if you give some advice on that. It's, I wish I had some, it's a really <laughs> good question. And coming out of this last one, I'm, I'm self-reflecting asking myself that very question, were there any points along the way that I should have given up? Yeah. You know, it might just be in the DNA of a founder that you, you just do everything you can to succeed. Um, and you don't just give up the ship. Um, even though there might have been some points along the way that said the opportunity cost here is too high, you know, it's all about opportunity cost, right? Should I be going and doing something else um, you also have this sense of responsibility to investors, mm -hmm. right? You don't just walk away. Like, I'm not just going to go and say this isn't working. You, you know, if you're a straight up person, you want to do everything you can to provide a return on investment to the people that believed in you in the first place. And so you just bend over backwards to try to crack the code until somebody says you can't. Yeah. So your back breaks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There. Cool. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, really appreciate you coming in. My awesome conversation. Yeah, uh, fun. Good to catch up. We'll go. Uh, we'll go grab lunch and talk about probably, VCs now. Probably yeah. the best one you've had so far out of all of these. Uh, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Also, the you are definitely the biggest prima donna. We've oh. had. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you mean the green M and M's were too yeah, much? Yeah. Yeah. That you was. You mean the fact that I asked for this coffee? Your rider was horrible. I mean, right. I gotta say, the I didn't rider. even get milk or sugar. <laughs> It's black. <laughs> and God knows if it's instant. I don't even know. It's probably instant. Who the, it's Tanka. It's curry, <laughs> curry cups here at Gateway. All right. Well, thanks again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Right. Uh, we'll see you next week when we have Jim McAlpine on. So, and Ben will probably be back. But like I said earlier, he's dead to me. Have a good day. <laughs>